Good morning, everybody. My name is Brian Lambie from Red Brick Communications. I want to thank AMO, the Association for, of Municipalities of Ontario, for giving us the opportunity to do these weekly calls. These calls are related to COVID-19 and folks that have to communicate COVID-19. That being said, we'll take any questions that we need to take or that's on people's minds who want to be helpful. Uh, we are using Zoom and from time to time we're doing calls with us. Um, for those who are new to Zoom, uh, just a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, the, uh, if we go to the Q&A section, they're down at the bottom. If you click on the very bottom, uh, there's a Q&A button and there's also a chat box. You can click on chat. Um, Chat's probably the best feature we found in these calls. Um, oftentimes, uh, questions will get raised and members of the audience will have their own thoughts about uh, who, uh, 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 thoughts about a solution to a problem. So we encourage you to use the chat box. If there's something in particular that brought you to, to today's call, uh, please let us know. Enter that in the chat box. You can, we'll take questions there. Uh, and we do want to know what is helpful to you. I'm going to introduce our panel really quickly, and we've got a real range of uh, people here from different parts of the province, and that's helpful. So uh, let's go from largest municipality to smallest. Uh, no offense to, to Jason, <laughs> uh, but we'll start with Patrick Casey, uh, the Communications Director for York Region. Uh, population 1.2 million and counting, says Patrick. I'm sure he's right. It probably goes up daily. Uh, next is probably Patty uh, McQuaig from uh, London, Ontario, population 390,000. Rachel Wraith is from Ajax, population 120,000. Jessica Linthorne is just edging above Jason. Uh, she's from Saugeen Shores, population 14,000, maybe 14,500. Uh, we won't, yeah, we won't sure. deny the total. <laughs> um, and last, we have Jason Harnett from uh, Gravenhurst with population of uh, 12,000. However, what's your population in the summer, Jason? Oh, close to about 30. So yeah, a lot of visitors in the summer. Okay, so uh, Jessica, you can you can you guys can split it 50-50 uh, depending on the season. All right, um, I'm going to open it up to questions in a minute. I know that one of the uh, things that the, the ones that I think uh, I do want to cover off on this call uh, this week, a busy question has been: Should people go to cottage country or not? Um, mm -hmm. And quite frankly, it's been a very divisive distraction on that. Um, the other one uh, that I, I know we should be talking about is labor relations. There have been, by my count, thousands of municipal employees laid off over the past week across the province, and I know that there are probably more to come. Um, we said on last week's call that uh, labor relations is where you should be looking a week ahead. Um, we also want to give some thought today about where you're looking next week in terms of what kinds of communication are you planning to have to get out in the, in the you know, week or two uh, ahead. So anyway, um, I'm going to uh, just throw it out, uh, first of all, in terms of uh, uh, any lessons that were learned this week over last week, if there's anyone on the panel that uh, really found something different or a shift. For me, it was the labor relations piece, uh, but I'll throw it out to the panelists on what they saw different this week and, and what worked for them. I'll start. One of the things that we're seeing is a lot of confusion over the provincial orders and they change fairly rapidly. So we have a lot of questions in our communities around, can I cycle? Can I walk on the path? What can I do in a park? What can I do? So we're really trying this week to focus on simplifying that content as much as possible and putting, first of all, another PSA out, but also some images that really reflect, you know, here are the behaviors and the things that are all right. And here are the things that we need to reinforce as just not being safe and not being even permitted under the provincial orders right now. All right, uh, anyone else? We did get the revised list of essential services. Jessica was talking about some of the challenges they've had in terms of making sure that uh, that's understood and just even internally uh, navigating that list. Um, one of the questions that we did get uh, from a smaller municipality this week was, uh, uh, we're moving to a four day week uh, work week. A number of municipalities are getting creative about how they're going to stretch out uh, uh, their budgets. And uh, the question was, how do we tell people that the office is closed on Friday? Mm -hmm. And my own view on that was a couple things. We can use social media accounts to set expectations. 
I hate the image of a sign on a doorway that says we're closed. That's always a very good picture. To, uh, a picture that circulates on, uh, on social media or headlines is a very negative image. I love a question, uh, a sign on a door that says, uh, bear with us. We've, uh, we've gone to reduce staff. We're working from home and we're trying to help you in new ways. Um, that means that you would shift up the workload and offset schedules so that they, in a pinch, would be able to get a live voice on a Friday. We would explain this to them. Usually you get credit for muddling through. Um, you don't, uh, it's very difficult to explain office closed. So that's my own thoughts on that. I'm wondering if uh, there's other internal uh, challenges that you've had on the panel in terms of communicating some of these changes uh, or some of the other uh, needs that you've had to try to explain this to the public as you shift hours. So I can start if that's all right. So we closed the municipal office to the public a few weeks ago now. And one of the first steps that the communications team took was reaching out to all department heads saying, okay, tell us how you're modifying your service. What are you continuing to do during this closure to the public? And how are you offering that service? So if you visit our website, uh, so it's soggyandshores.ca, the COVID alert will pop up. And as part of that COVID alert, there's a PDF link that's now telling you about municipal service delivery during this closure to the public. We found that piece to be really powerful because it is identifying if you need a building permit, if you need to follow up on an inspection, this is your contact. Uh, you can do something online. If you need to learn about, you know, when spring programs are happening or if they're not, this is the who you need to contact and who you need to follow. So we've used that. It's just a simple PDF document that's branded for Soggy and Shores um, that is feeding people the information that they need to know during the office closure. Um, we've used that, that PDF on the website, but we've also posted it here at the office. So should somebody think they're gonna come in and pay their taxes, now they're reading that this is the update on, on your taxes and, and you can't come into this building right now. All right, anyone else on the panel? I'm also interested in internal and external communication because I'm sure there's been plenty of uh, challenges internally, particularly for your larger folks. Brian, yeah. Brian at New York Region, I think, I think one of the, uh, the common issues that we all have is, uh, as Jessica touched upon, is the fact that our municipal buildings are closed to the public. So I, I think heading into the long weekend, for the most part, I think that decision has is, is already been taken care of and, uh, and people know that we're in, into this new normal. As it, as it relates to communication functions, and you talked about that a little bit earlier, um, at York Region, what we, we're in week two of a, of a dedicated response team approach and uh, we have decentralized communication at York Region. So what I mean by that is corporately, we have a, a corporate communications function, but there's communication functions in all of our departments. And what we've done is we've gone to a, a two-shift, 16-hour uh, rotation. So we have uh, three teams um, uh, operating uh, eight hours uh, over two shifts a day. So one shift starts at 7, goes to 3 in the afternoon. The second shift starts at 2 in the afternoon, goes to 10 o'clock at night with a, a one-hour crossover of knowledge. So we've, uh, we've ramped up that communication efforts from about 17 to 20 in our branch to 50 uh, dedicated staff over the last week and and it's just needed because the volume and everybody can attest to that as it relates to the communication function uh, is uh, is immense so hopefully that's helpful I think that is helpful I mean Jessica we were talking about how do you get communications uh, staff recognized as an essential service I think just the fact that York Region has gone from 20 to 50 um, sharing that message with your own people internally I mean we're not asking for 50 uh, but we do recognize that if we normally have two, we probably need four or five. Um, now, uh, Patrick, I'm curious, uh, when you say you've ramped up from 20 to 50, does that mean you've pulled from other departments to recruit other people to assist? Yeah, absolutely. So in those earlier days when, when, when people were being sent home and uh, we're looking at our essential services, and, and that work continues as it relates to, uh, like a lot of our work is, is, has been and continues to be business as normal on some of these other fronts. Uh, yes, there's new provincial directives, and, and I think the big one uh, from Saturday is, is as it relates to uh, construction and infrastructure, and uh, we're still looking at that and how that will apply to some of our large-scale infrastructure projects. So uh, up until this point, a lot of this work continues, so, but we have been able to redeploy uh, staff, communication staff from, from other, other areas in the department and come to work on this dedicated team. And uh, Patrick, I, I got to know, how are you managing a team of 50 people that are all working from home 
uh, as a manager, how are you making sure that uh, that many people are aligned on messages and in the loop? You know what? It's uh, it's easier than than we thought. This is something that's never been done before uh, at York Region, um, and uh, the remote aspect is is working flawless. I think the uh, the IT infrastructure caught up to the needs really quickly. If you go back uh, a couple of weeks ago, when when people started to work remotely, um, the teleconferencing lines, Bell, the Cisco lines, there was you know worldwide issues. Uh, moving to the platform of Zoom, I. I, I, I I can attest that I'd never even heard of Zoom two weeks hmm. ago, and uh, wish I bought shares in it. So um, the 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 approach the approach has been fairly flawless, really. Uh, and because everybody's just dedicated to helping out, everybody just wants to help and, and do a good job. Uh, and I think that's what's uh, made things easier for everybody. Patrick, I found the same, and I think it's really interesting how quickly we've all, like across the board, been able to adapt to what I've called kind of this new normal. And everyone is like on side and you know a, a new project comes in or a new task comes in and the team is like i've got this i've got this i've got this mm. so we're kind of creating a, a centralized approach to it but really delegating tasks off so that people have um, specific projects over the course of each day hopefully um, but we're all kind of connecting as best as we can without the ability to physically come together yeah that's great we're, we're actually telling people that when their shift is done your shift is done you're done yeah. you stop and, and people don't want to so it's almost the opposite is managing uh, their own personal expectations because uh, because they, they just want to keep going and, and want to keep contributing. So that's probably my biggest challenge is personally being able to, to check out and, and shut down. Patrick, I'm wondering if like if you actually follow that as well, that when your shift is done, it's done. And, and same to everyone on the panel. Are you kind of working every day all day or are you also able to take some breaks? Well, we're not here, Patty, to talk about me. <laughs> One of the things, I'll just add a little bit to that. Um, one of the things that our team, it's very simple, but our team, um, because we did have some help from another department and, and today we've talked a little bit more about who else in the organization has um, some writing skill set that we can yeah. start to tap into. And um, so that's that's great and, and that's I'm very encouraged by that. But we've created a simple Google Doc where we have outlined all of our key messaging. And this is this is the messaging, it's approved. This is what you've given to the mayor. This is what we are all going to stick by. And just, you know, like uh, Patrick said, just really working with this, this new normal and these, these platforms that we've had, uh, but because we're not seeing each other every day now, or having these conversations, um, being able to keep all of these messages in a good portal that are approved and the right people have it at the right time. And, and that's how, where we are seeing success because we are being consistent and we know how to do that. Yeah, I think uh, consistency is key, making sure everyone's saying the same messages. Uh, making sure, you know, if you are going to be out of your offices, all your answering machines say the same thing. Yeah. Demonstrating accessibility through, you know, social media. Uh, and I think we've been maintaining our social media levels. We, we know that there are a lot of traffic, a lot of concerns and inquiries come through that channel and uh, staying on top of it and alerting those that need to be aware of, you know, the issues that are arising. Right now, Gravenhurst still is uh, acting as normal. It's, there's a skeleton staff. Um, on site and uh, I'll admit I, I'm in maybe every other day just to check in with uh, various people um, and, and the mayor who you know our mayor was actually in self-isolation the first two weeks of of the outbreak so we were working with him from home and uh, he was creating his messages and we were making sure that was getting out there but just uh, yeah being accessible demonstrating to your public that you still are accessible um, and I think a lot of them have been quite understanding with that. Creating that dedicated COVID page on your website, yeah. uh, every, everything that comes up, you know, continuing to add to that and, and pointing your audiences to that area for the most up-to-date, reliable information. Okay, I'm gonna to move to some of the questions we've got uh, coming in. Again, if you have a question for the panel, just uh, we, you have two options. The best option is probably the webinar chat, the, the chat feature because other people on the call, there's 150, there's almost 160 people on this call. So if you, you can ask us a question or you can pose it uh, to everybody on the chat and often that's where you'll find the answers. Um, one of the questions that came in, is anybody using Microsoft Teams? And I know the answer to that is yes. There was also another question uh, that came in and said, you know, a number of municipalities have banned the use of Zoom. 
Um, and that may be the case. My, my gut tells me that all of these platforms, because they are fairly new and were not built for this kind of mass use and uh, sophisticated use, uh, all of them are going to have security concerns, I think, at this point. I think that's a reality. An IT person will tell me otherwise. In my experience, I've seen most people using Zoom, some people using Microsoft Teams. Um, I haven't run across anybody using GoToMeetings, but I've heard a couple of, I mean, I've heard it at the beginning, people were, were using that. I'm curious if there's any other platforms your folks are using or if you found any issues with using these. Brian, as it relates to the Microsoft Teams, we do use that at York Region, um, but uh, we actually were in the process of ramping that up more corporate wide. Uh, I think this is one of the nice things that uh, is, is, and there are going to be good things that come out of a global pandemic. Uh, and one of them is the use of technology and the use of uh, more people working remotely, uh, working from home, uh, maybe taking away the, uh, the, the sort of that management worry about are they going to be productive? How is that going to work? All of those questions. So we are, we are seeing some benefits from that. We are ramping up the Microsoft Teams. Our IT folks are doing that. Um, that um, that's just going to accelerate uh, and help us uh, along the way. As it relates to Zoom, we did... Um, we did quickly uh, disable the, the chat uh, feature and the recording feature uh, in Zoom just from a, a privacy security standpoint. So, so we are using Zoom, but we've, we've taken those uh, two features off. So if you are uh, following this call from York Region, use the Q&A button if that's still <laughs> available to you. <laughs> the, um, um, I can tell you we did the Rural Ontario Association uh, Roma board meeting. Uh, or we, we had a, a, a Roma emergency meeting uh, to deal with COVID-19 uh, earlier this week. And uh, the, the challenges on broadband were evident for every single person on that call, including uh, callers from Caledon, Ontario. So you're still within the 905 area code. Um, also, uh, we had somebody on the call from Ottawa. And, you know, Ottawa's got rural areas. And uh, even uh, for that caller, it was very difficult. To improve that stream, uh, we were shutting down video feature um, and, and uh, just using the audio, uh, which did help tremendously. Certainly keeping your kids off the internet at a time when everybody's schooling is also uh, gonna be tricky, uh, but I think necessary for a lot of these people on feeds. And the last thing that gets me about these video calls is, is the, the idea that we have to use video. Uh, four weeks ago, um, all of these calls would have been straight conference calls, um, but for whatever reason now, every single call seems to be a video call. And I think that is going to create broadband challenges for a lot of the rural uh, folks, uh, particularly now that kids are, are using it for school. Anyway, just my thoughts on that. Someone else mentioned that WebEx is uh, being used at the city of Guelph. I'm sure it's being used uh, other places. Um, one of the questions we got was, what is a weekend? So I think uh, that's on everybody's mind. <laughs> Brian, I just, Brian, I never heard it. Oops, sorry. I was just saying the weekend's a singer. <laughs> um, the, um, are, are most municipalities laying off staff, or uh, are they uh, trying to do that or uh, considering to do that? Um, uh, and looking for alternate roles for all employees. So I can tell you that I've really felt a palpable shift in about the past six days with the people that we speak to. Uh, we predicted it would come on last week's call and we're in the thick of it now. Um, so much so that uh, there has been discussions with AMO and others to see about having a labor relations type call uh, like this, just for human resources managers and that sort of thing. Um, and AMO is actively looking at how it can provide some resources. What we are finding is that there are a ton of questions around labor relations matters, and there's a number, people are just kind of muddling through on their own. A lot of that muddling is being done by elected officials asking questions about what our options are and, and, and what they can and cannot do. So AMO is aware of that. I'm wondering if there's, uh, if anybody on the panel here has had uh, examples this week where they've had to do, where they've had layoffs or had to communicate that. Yesterday, in fact, we announced that about 1,100 temporary and casual employees were impacted. So we deferred hiring for some and we put another number on a declared emergency leave. So these are typically the people that would come in and run all of our summer programs that by provincial order we're not able to run right now. Um, our kind of messaging to our full-time employees is that right now, uh, given that we're kind of coming up on the steep part of the curve and recognizing that we could be into kind of contingency planning 
from a business operations perspective is that everyone else needs to be ready and able to come to work because we expect that we'll be impacted by COVID as an organization, not just as, you know, offering services in the city. Anyone else uh, uh, dealing with us this week? Okay, so we, um, I got uh, rustled out of bed by a municipality early Saturday morning that needed help with one because Smokey Thomas uh, from OPSU uh, wrote a, a scathing uh, news release against them. Um, I have to tell you that that news release was so over the top that it made our job easier. <laughs> so uh, you may want to look at some of the messages coming out of places like OPSU to get your head around what that's going to feel like and taste, uh, taste like. For you. Um, I also think if you haven't already done it, it's a time to uh, connect with whoever does lead your human resources matters to make sure that you're not rustled out of bed on a, a Saturday morning and thrown into it. A lot of these things are things that you can prepare for and, if, and, and you should be touching base with those people to make sure that they're not surprising you next week. All right, because uh, it is a reality in a number of places. All right, um, I want to get to this business of um, uh, there's been some talk about counselor, like making sure everybody's aligned, and that's really messages. Um, we're also finding the challenge of aligning councils. Uh, Amos put out a guide for councils so that they can deliver the bad news to councils instead of you. Um, but on this issue of whether people should come to cottage country or not, um, this has been a, a case where a lot of counselors and elected officials have been carrying the ball on messaging, and it really has become a terrible distraction. Um, I think from Amos' perspective, we're trying to get the message out simply to say, you're supposed to be staying at home right now. Mm -hmm. and, and, and rather than say home or cottage, we're saying stay put, stay where you are, um, so, and stay settled. Um, it's a time to be indoors, not outdoors. It's not a time for unnecessary travel. But Jason, I'm wondering how you're uh, sort of coping with this one in, uh, in Gravenhurst. Well, it's a sensitive issue for sure um, because proper, seasonal property owners are a big component of what Muskoka and you know this area is all about. So we, we do recognize that. And uh, there's been a couple conflicting messages out there. Uh, you know, we're a two-tier municipality and uh, under the district of Muskoka. And uh, there are some sub subtle changes in the way that uh, some of the municipalities have been doing business. Um, I know Georgian Bay has, you know, has closed down their docks and uh, has had some, has had some issues at the marinas just with people not understanding, you know, that that's the, the business path that they've selected. And it may be the case for a lot of us down the road. Um, I think what, what I've tried to work with our mayor is best is just to educate people to, you know, inform people of the resources that we have available here in Muskoka and surrounding and, uh, and let them come to their own conclusion at, at the moment. Don't dictate to them if they can come or not. I, I, don't, I think that's a dangerous uh, message to put out there at the moment. Um, so it's, it's, it's care. It's a carefully, type message and I think it's going to get even increasingly challenging as the weather warms up and the the, the lakes continue to thaw out. Mm. So we in Soggy and Shores similar to Gravenhurst population doubles triples whatever it does it gets really big uh, so we're Port Elgin and Southampton on the coast of Lake Huron uh, in Bruce County. So our mayor's done a very great job uh, his messaging really is to stay where your primary health care provider is. Home is where your primary health care provider is and when you put it in that context if I, if my family doctor is in Kitchener and I have a primary residence in Kitchener, I should stay in Kitchener. So, you know, he's done a very good job at, at referencing that message around stay where your healthcare provider is. And then also saying, you know, the medical officer of Gray Bruce is suggesting people from Gray Bruce shouldn't be leaving Gray Bruce as people from outside shouldn't be coming in. We need to stay where our primary healthcare provider is. So we're not, you know, we're, we're speaking to our seasonal residents, certainly. We're speaking to day trippers too. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's people in the city that would love to come up and go for a hike and grab takeout. And it's not a good time to do that. Lots of trails are closed. Uh, the beaches are closed. And um, the other thing that Mayor Charbonneau here in Sogging Shores has done very well is during media interviews, and he has had some interviews with um, bigger city centers. So he was with KW uh, recently in Waterloo Region. And uh, he's done some other big media outlets, which is great to get our message to the city centers. But he ends every interview saying, this is really hard for me to say. And as a mayor, and you know, two weeks ago, I never would have said, don't come here. But times are as they are, and we're in an emergency, and you need to stay where your primary health care provider is. 
So we've crafted lots of good messaging like that, and I'd be happy to, to share some of that if people have questions. Okay, so Brian, one of the, uh, one of the, Brian, one of the things uh, that we did on Saturday is um, our, through our control group with the chairman, we made the decision to close uh, all of the, uh, the York Regional Forest. And, and that was a big decision and a, and a tough decision to make. That's 2,300 uh, hectares of, uh, of land, 21 uh, public tracts. And uh, the, the decision was made, wasn't made lightly. Um, the difficulty is enforcing uh, the parking lots uh, where people uh, drive. Prim primarily, these are all off of regional roads. So people are primarily driving to the parking lots to, uh, to access our forest. Uh, not, not having the ability to maintain uh, distancing, uh, physical and social. Uh, we took a lot of heat for that over the weekend on, on social uh, because people want to be outside, they want to exercise, people are at home. Um, but you know, primarily the, the public health message is to stay at home. And, uh, and we felt that, uh, that this follows the, uh, the, public, uh, the public health direct. So that's, uh, that's been an issue for us over the last time. Patrick, are you enforcing that through like bylaw officers or, or through other means and, and fining people if they don't follow those orders? So we do have a, a forest, some forest bylaw officers. Okay. Of course, the, the, the sheer nature of the size that we're, we're covering makes it difficult. Yeah. We've, uh, we've sort of followed the, uh, the lead of our medical officer of health and, and, and he is not one to issue section two orders and things of that nature, uh, only as a last resort. Uh, the power of persuasion is uh, where we're coming from. So I can tell you in Mississauga, they have issued a couple of, uh, uh, they've written a couple of tickets and, and Mayor Bonnie Crombie tweeted out uh, mock images like Jane Doe uh, tickets uh, to show that they were doing that. And uh, it got a lot of traction, uh, most of it supportive. Um, so I think she did want to make sure people understood it was real. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, maybe lay a few and publish them broadly so you don't yeah. have to lay a ton. Um, Rachel, you wanted to add? Yeah, so uh, in Ajax, we have the largest stretch of publicly owned waterfront in Southern Ontario, um, and it's located in the southern part of, of the town of Ajax. We're really small geographically, but we do have quite a large population of about 120,000. Um, so we are getting a ton of residents that are driving down to our waterfront in order to go for, for a walk. Um, so our messaging has, uh, has kind of changed as we've uh, ramped up our enforcement measures as well. Um, so we took a very measured approach to it just to kind of uh, start to sort of see, you know, what the response would be like from the community. Um, so at first we were seeing people driving down. We have several parking lots along the waterfront um, and they were parking and then kind of spilling over into the residential areas. Uh, so a first step that we took was actually just closing down um, the parking lots, but then you start to see people still driving and then they're, they're parking along the residential roads. Uh, so we've now, um, last Friday, the mayor released a statement that we would be um, increasing our enforcement measures uh, in terms of parking. And our messaging was if you need to go out for uh, you know, a health break, a fitness break, that you need to stay in your neighborhoods for that. Um, so we continue to uh, encourage people to go outside for fresh air, to go for a walk, but to utilize their own neighborhood network and to not drive to a destination. Um, on top of having our, our beautiful waterfront in the south end, we have um, a really great conservation area in the north end. <laughs> Uh, so we were having the same difficulties as well there, where people were going, they're congregating, and you had the large group. Um, so we haven't taken the measures where we've closed down the waterfront or closed down uh, Greenwood Conservation Area, but we have closed parking. Um, and we are actively uh, like patrolling that area as well. Um, and Durham Regional Police Services, which covers Ajax, um, is also doing patrols in sort of those high traffic areas as well. Um, so, you know, it's similar stance to Mississauga that, you know, we will, we will ticket it um, if we do need to go to that, uh, to that measure. Um, but we really looked at last weekend as being a, an enforcement and an education blitz, an opportunity to really educate the public um, and utilize our bylaw officers um, as well as DRPS in terms of getting that messaging out there. Um, and we are seeing that as, uh, as being well received. Um, but again, our Mary put out a strong statement saying that if, these, if this is not uh, followed, if these orders are not followed and these measures are, are not um, having the impact that is needed, then, you know, the step could be taken that we close our water. And the um, there that was uh, DPRS, that's uh, Durham Regional Police, uh, for those not in the area or have never. <laughs> um, the, um, I can tell you I'm in South Mississauga and it looks like a bit of a zombie apocalypse out here. We have all these people that come out and mill around in the streets down here and it's really quite crowded. Um, and I think part of that is because there are so many municipalities that are telling people to go out and enjoy themselves and have walks, but in the very urban areas that are high traffic, 
uh, that really doesn't work out yeah. very well. Um, we had another question, uh, or another question was proposed is, you know, would it be helpful for, you know, non uh, cottage country municipalities to get the message out that people shouldn't be going to cottage country. And I actually think that would be a mistake. Um, this is an area, it's a, it's a can of worms that you don't want to open. If it's not open, I'd leave it there. Um, this, another question we got was, um, are, how many of you are having your message in, messages led by the medical officer of health? And putting those two questions together, I think the best answer on this, you know, where should people go? Should they go to cottage country or not? is to follow the direction of uh, the province's medical officer of health or your local medical officer of health. It's time to stay put, wash your hands, only go outside if it's essential, no essential travel, and all those messages do carry the ball. And I think if all municipalities are focused there, um, that would help uh, keep people from, from driving from town to town. Uh, which we're one of the messages that I, sorry, one of the messages that I've seen that is very, very simple that I think every time I'm trying to reinforce it is the virus doesn't move. People move it. So anytime you have a chance to not risk moving it, not risk, you know, passing it on to someone else, you should be doing that. Um, the other so, thing, Brian, is, is I, I just, I would say that I think all levels of government are doing a fantastic job as it relates yeah. to the response to COVID, um, and, you know, regardless of party and color and stripe. Uh, I think the nuances are in the, in the, the, the directives uh, because, you know, what the, the federal government says may be a, a, a little bit different than the, than the provincial government, which may be a little bit different than the, the regional or local government. And I think, I think our residents are sort of picking up on these nuances and they're, and they're looking for sort of the, that clarification on what does this actually mean for, for me where I live. And, and public health units operate differently in, in different jurisdictions. So uh, I think we all just from a communication standpoint have to be mindful of that. And, and of course, correct where, where we can. Yeah, I think that, that unity of messaging coming out of government is so much different than what we see south of the border. And that question of, you know, how many of you are having your messaging led by the medical officer of health? I think one of the terrible things to do right now would be to do to be to uh, contradict a medical officer of health. We do have this wonderful alignment. If your medical officer of health is saying things that uh, make you scratch your head, that's an issue you'll have to deal with. But from a public perspective, I think the public really needs to see that alignment and know that it's there. Um, we are seeing amazing uh, people doing amazing things and rising to the occasion, and we're certainly trying to get that message out. We've noticed that um, individual municipalities have been doing that, so I may go there as a next uh, question, so just think about that. I'm gonna be curious about what you're doing to make sure you're praising your own staff and capturing that visually on photos and, and video, that sort of thing. Um, but one of the questions that came up is, what is your messaging around restaurants? which I can tell you this has been a hot topic in our house. Half the house wants to order pizza and half the house doesn't. I'm wondering what you folks are telling people, if anything, about fast food. Brian, I mean, we don't typically get into those conversations. Again, that's where we would point to our medical officer, um, Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit. We refer any calls that we get to them, uh, emails, we work very closely with them. Um, Dr. Charles Gardner of the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit has daily Facebook briefings. Uh, they've been excellent where he takes questions from reporters, takes questions from the community on everything um, from restaurants to, to docs. So this is something that we're watching closely and we're pointing people in our community to watch as well for those type of answers. Can we have anything different than that? I, I think one of the things that, that we've seen throughout all of this is that um, individuals and businesses are making the decisions for us in, in a lot of cases. So if you look at the restaurant industry, uh, when the directive uh, came down at the time to, to stop sort of some of these non-essential services, there hasn't been a lot of pushback uh, from the industry. Uh, this is that are remaining open for takeout. I think there's a lot of people trying to, uh, trying to support them as best they can, um, you know, and trying to, to go out and, and get that takeout and, and then go back, you know, immediately back home. I think we saw that last weekend with the construction industry, and I think that was probably part of the change that the province made, uh, is that the construction industry was sort of saying, okay, I don't think it may not be safe to work, so I'm just gonna go home, uh, regardless of, of, uh, of a directive from, from anybody or from any level of government. So I think a lot of these decisions, uh, individuals are just putting their health uh, and the health of their family first and foremost, 
and uh, and going home and staying home. Uh, we had a question uh, come in about OPP communities. Uh, how many of you have communities that are policed by the OPP? Anyone? Uh, so Jason. So the question was, uh, how do we uh, how do we coordinate messaging with the OPP when so much of their messaging is centrally coordinated? And I'm going to let Jason think about that for a minute. If there's been a challenge there. Um, I can tell you that one of the most important lessons to come out of the, the mall collapse in Elliott Lake is that the OPP does not look after love in your community. They look after traffic, they look after rooting people, they look after keeping people back from the scene. But I think uh, there was a lot of expectation there that the OPP, when they took a lead on communication, would help that town lead itself through a very difficult period. And that's not what the OPP does. Uh, it really, that is a requirement of the town, a mayor, a community itself. So um, while coordinating messaging on the OPP uh, is something you may have to do, I want you to make sure you recognize the limits that OPP really only looks after those responsibilities. Jason, have you had any experience with the OPP that have been challenging or any thoughts there? I think enforcement's been a little bit challenging. Um, the people in the community do need to uh, realize that we have very limited resources in terms of enforcement. It's on a you know Monday to Friday, 8, 8 a.m. to 4.30 basis. Um, so we really do rely on police enforcement. Our messaging has, has basically been that all provincial orders are handled by the OPP. I mean, we had the provincial uh, fire ban put on everyone as well. Um, that is an area that our, our bylaw officers are handling, um, but again, we have limited resources. Um, there was there was some real gray and, and confusion around it at the beginning, and I think even some confusion amongst the ranks in the OPP, whether you know um, they were doing um, provincial type um, uh, enforcement on some of these orders, and that's that's the message we we've stayed with. Uh, basically is to point people towards the OPP and we've given out those numbers and those the email addresses for people to share those uh, inquiries or complaints. So we had a message come in uh, on the restaurant front here from the city of Cambridge. Our economic development team has developed a map of local restaurants still open and we're in the process of developing a communications rollout uh, plan to promote local restaurants that provide takeout and delivery. So uh, there's probably a use it own risk uh, undertone there, but they're making it uh, easier for those people that want to take the plunge. All right. Ryan, I just, yeah. If I could just jump back to the policing one for one uh, second. Sogging Shores Police Service, we do have our own police service here. And uh, they've just put out a news release um, that they've got a very strong process right now built with Crime Stoppers. So we're doing messaging today. We've got a news release with a few different topics to go out at three o'clock this afternoon. And one of those messages will be around this process in place with Crime Stopper. So if you if you see something and you think something needs to be reported and enforced, don't call 911. Call yeah. this number. And setting that program and having that communication clear to the community as well. And then I just want to give a shout out to my friends in Cambridge Act Dev team because they've done some great work. And, and uh, I know that they should get in touch with us if you guys have a few minutes. We're doing some really cool stuff too to support economic development right now. If you want to see another example of that restaurant approach, uh, we just got one from St. Catharines. They've got a website called Pickup STC for St. Catharines, pickupstc.ca, and it's a website that does the same thing. So thanks for sending that example in. Um, in terms of using examples and other materials, I want to segue just a little bit to the fact that uh, there has been some sharing of materials, and thank you for those people who have sent that in. I can tell you that. Uh, um, AMO and Roma, the municipal associations, we are desperate to get video and photographs of your people in action right now. Um, we will be shifting gears at some point back to a discussion about public health funding and public health organization in Ontario, and that'll be a very interesting discussion now um, after this. It already was before this. Um, and there will be a, mo a need at some day to remind people of the heroic things that paramedics and public health officials have done. Um, we need photographs and short videos that do that. So we are looking for that. We're also looking to thank employees through social media posts, that sort of thing. We don't want to use stock images. So anything you've got there uh, would be helpful. Um, you can send that stuff through to an AMO uh, email address, which is COVID-19 at amo.on.ca. Uh, 
ca and that's the COVID-19 website for AMO. On there, there is a section that has uh, infographics, not as many as we'd like, but it's got infographics and samples that municipalities have sent in where they've scrubbed away uh, the, um, the logos. Now I'm gonna share one if I can here from City of London, and I'll let Patty speak to what this campaign's about. Patty, can you see that all right? Um, not yet, but yeah. <laughs> I'll talk to speak to that. So what we've tried to do in addition to putting out a lot of the kind of heavy content and the messages around do's and don'ts, we've really tried to highlight the positive things that are happening in our community and really the ways that people are being resilient and adjusting. So this is one in a series of images that we've used. We've got images that have um, kind of the same kind of illustrator depiction of, of frontline workers, whether they're people who are sanitation operators or um, firefighters, police, and, and really just try and run these on a regular basis. So in addition to the messages around stay out of our parks, we're also acknowledging that there's some really kind, nice things happening in the community as well. Um, we use a hashtag London kindness, and we also keep an eye on our social media feeds for examples of things that other, people's are do other people are doing and share those out with the has hashtag your London kindness is showing. So it's, it's really a way to, to kind of acknowledge that in this difficult time, there's some great ways that people are connecting and, and being resilient and being innovative. So we've used these illustrations to, to call that out. Um, if anyone's interested in using any of them, we could easily uh, take off the London Kindness hashtag and share those with folks as well. Okay, so thank you for that example. Um, you know, we just, we did a, a webinar on, uh, for AMO on content creation, uh, which ran last week. And there's a whole series of social media webinars that AMO's put together over the past couple of years. There's about uh, nine of them, at least in the can. Uh, AMO has been working to try to dig up some of those recordings and make them available for about $30 uh, a hit uh, to uh, municipalities, uh, also done through their COVID page. So um, one of the other questions we've had a, a lot of, I think, last week, and I don't want to flesh it out too much here, is what do we do with trolls on Facebook? Uh, but uh, I'm curious about a troll check. How, how, are the, how are the trolls been this week, folks? Is it getting better or worse? <laughs> mm, we're having a couple of a couple things that just keep coming up and we keep giving an answer and you know people just aren't happy with the process or, or expect something different or they we get a lot of well you know Owen Sounds doing this or Georgian Bluffs is doing that and and referencing other communities that are around us and, um, and that's that's difficult you know we're a number of smaller communities and and sometimes and that's those are gray county examples and we're in Bruce County so Sometimes, you know, geographically we're close, but we're in different regions and we have different decisions and, and it's hard, but we're, we're managing. We're doing okay. I'll give you that. <laughs> I, I know I've had a number of calls from people saying, you know, like I, this feels like a bad idea, but, you know, remind me it's a bad idea. You know, like this person's really <laughs> this off and, you know, like we want to let them have it. And I just remind people, like all the stages that you go through in crisis communications, one of the classic ones is, is avoid a bunker mentality, and you will slip into that. And, you know, we're seeing it. Uh, and uh, so I think we're at that stage, and people need to recognize that frustration and uh, stress and lack of sleep can get the better of us. And it's time to, uh, uh, to go for a walk and stay positive, uh, even when, uh, when a lot of the people around us are, are perhaps their nerves are getting frayed. Yeah. Brian, I think they're called trolls for a reason, and we can probably leave it at that. But I, I, I would rather be uh, I would rather be accused of making the wrong decision for the right reason down the road. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so I'm just going to see if we've got other questions that have come in. A couple other ones have popped in. I, while I'm doing that, I'm wondering if there's any uh, apps that you folks are using that you have found particularly helpful. Um, I think those people who hadn't discovered Canva. If, if they haven't discovered Canva by now, they should uh, immediately after this call check out Canva. That's a good example. I'm wondering if there's other apps that you folks are using or that you've uh, really discovered have been helpful in the last uh, few weeks. Bueller, anyone? No. Maybe I can say something here, Brian. Is I think I think for us, what we've found is the tried and true. Uh, we're using we're using all of our platforms that we've used previously. Um, and and just ramped up the efforts on it. We've uh, we have a dedicated COVID page which everybody uh, would similarly have, and ours is York.ca/slash 
COVID-19. Um, and our, our dedicated pages on our site generally get anywhere between 100 and 500 views uh, because we, we're just always adding new content. This page, we're adding new content, interactive dashboard, uh, we're over 800,000 page views over the last uh, three weeks uh, since we've done a more of a dedicated effort on that. Um, you know, the, the, the volume of activity through Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, YouTube uh, is immense. Uh, people are, are thirsty for information. They're thirsty for knowledge. And, uh, you know, for us, we've just doubled down on, on our existing efforts. And, uh, and we've found it's been very helpful because people are getting the information. So I can tell you that after our last call, I was inundated with service providers that had found out about these calls and wanted to pitch all of their new apps and software and products that would be so helpful to Ontario municipalities right now and we should and that we should promote them. And my reaction to all of them were, you know, was are you high? This is not a time for people to try something new. This is a time for people to double down on what they know and what's working. Now, the one that I know people have experimented with and we promoted it in the past, very, very simple tool, is a teleprompter app. As much as we uh, enjoy uh, people, you know, just winging it on a video, um, some of you, maybe a few of you, a handful, tiny handful, have mayors that can't just wing it. <laughs> Uh, or police chiefs who can't just wing it, uh, and or medical officer of health uh, that struggle. Um, that teleprompter app, if you keep it uh, simple and short, uh, the message in plain language, it really is a helpful tool to get people to deliver things. Um, the People often ask me which version we use, and that's a tricky question. You can go up with me, and I'm happy to share that information afterwards. Um, Patty, you're getting a number of requests for those logos. Happy to share. If you've got info, if you've got infographics that you're proud of, if you can and you're willing to share, you just got to scrub the logo, send it into that COVID nineteen page, and it will be a real help to others uh, uh, that have it. Um, yeah, just Jason. just wanted to say, yeah, our mayor is he's moved to the teleprompter and he's doing okay with it. Where um, he was just you know holding up his notes like that. Um, but he, he has downloaded one of the teleprompter apps. He's done four videos now on YouTube. Um, I'm telling him to slow down a little bit, you know, make those messages a little more concise. Um, people don't want to sit through 15 minute videos, you know, try to keep uh, your, your main messages up front. And then also some of the video uh, program apps that you've recommended in the past, you know, Adobe Clip and Power Director, those are good ones. And uh, Zoom, I mean, we're still learning Zoom. Um, I don't know if some of the, my other colleagues on the line here are using Zoom for their council meetings, but we actually, we didn't stream any council meetings before this. So we've incorporated Zoom into streaming, working with the district of Muskoka to get us up on the air. And uh, it's happened. Uh, it's, not, it's not the best television in the world, but um, it, it's happening and uh, business continues. Okay, um, that bit, one of the questions I got on video one time was what's the perfect length of a social media video? And I said somewhere between eight seconds and nine seconds. So, um, you know, we have had a lot of people saying is what we need is a video, a creative video, and I'm not sure that's true. What we need is a video of paramedics opening the back door to, uh, to uh, an ambulance uh, and eight to 10 seconds of that kind of stuff that we can just layer in to social media posts. Um, so again, that kind of content, if you've got it, we'll, we'd love to have it and, uh, and you'll become the face of the province if you get and get it to us. Um, but really I don't think people should be looking for anything too sophisticated right now. I mean, if I, I'm not saying don't do it, but I think they underestimate just how, uh, effective simple can be right now. Um, uh, Patty's nodding. I don't know if you wanted to add to that. And Rachel, I think you had something you wanted to raise there. No, Rachel, just, just agreeing with you completely. I think, um, you know, we get requests to do videos that tend to be very, very long sometimes. And exactly what you said, people lose sight of how much information is out there and how quickly we need to be able to make a point. And, and trying to do that 15 minute video is just the wrong thing right now. Rachel? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just build off of that. Um, so we do have a lot of success with very short PSAs. We've been doing this with the mayor. Uh, so when we first uh, kind of got into the whole COVID mode, uh, we had kind of a formal address that the mayor did as kind of that first opportunity to, uh, to connect with the community. So that was a little bit more sophisticated. We kind of had the resources at the time that we were able to actually, um, you know, have some good production quality to it, include the 
closed captioning from an accessibility perspective um, and everything. Uh, but we we get huge traction on very short PSAs from the mayor. Uh, we did one um, last Thursday, uh, right down at the waterfront. Uh, we put it up online at eight o'clock Thursday evening. By 8 a.m. the next morning, we had over 5,000 views. Um, but again, reiterating that they do need to be really short, um, anywhere from 90 seconds to 130 seconds, especially for Twitter, so that you can directly upload it. Uh, where we find that we don't get as much video plays is when we actually have to put the video onto YouTube because of the length, and then we have to link to it, let's say, to a Twitter account. Uh, so you're not getting those automatic views and those automatic plays. Um, we've always been a huge proponent of video. Uh, I think it's something we're going to continue to do. While those short clips are great, uh, we had a whole bunch of like firefighters and uh, police officers uh, go by our local hospital earlier this week, and you just see this video of all these lights and sirens and everything, and it, it had about, I don't know, 3,500 views by the next morning. Um, so there are those kind of like breaking opportunities and everything like that, but uh, in terms of people reading versus watching a video, we definitely see a lot more traction and shares with video. Right, Brian, Brian. So, much, so, much, so much has changed over the last five weeks, uh, but a few things that haven't changed over the last number of weeks, and that is stay at home, practice good hand hygiene, and the one subtle change is uh, the social to physical distancing aspect. And, and I think those are good reminders from the communication standpoint to, to just keep doubling down the efforts on that because those right now and have been the, the key messages. So much else has changed, but those haven't. And those are good reminders. So that is a perfect segue. Uh, thank you, Patrick, because with the, the tail end of this call, I want to talk about where you see your communication going in the week ahead. Uh, what are the challenges? Is. Are there any uh, subtle changes in messaging that you're starting to look at going down the line? I can tell you one of the things that while, you, while the panel thinks about that, one of the things we're looking at doing internally is we're putting together a plain language guide uh, for communicators because physical distancing, social distancing, I just don't think these terms work well in a long-term care facility, <laughs> right? So uh, I, I don't know if anyone else has seen that uh, in terms of a plain language guide. Uh, we're trying to shoehorn it in with everything else that we're doing around here, but it, it, but we should have it ready in a day or two. Um, and if anybody has samples, we'll certainly take uh, anything we can see there in terms of uh, suggestions on terms you'd like to see us put in plain language. But will your messaging change in the week ahead? And are there communications pressures that you're worried about in the week ahead? Brian, the one thing that we're doing um, starting today, leading into Passover and then the Easter long weekend is, uh, obviously, we have a, a large geographic area in your region with nine municipalities, and we're seeing um, uh, differences in the in the local transmission in various communities, and, and some some higher and, and some lower. Uh, so the lower is the, the good news; the higher is something that we have to be mindful of. So we're actually uh, targeting some uh, some some paid social media advertising in the areas where uh, there's a uh, maybe some, some higher density or higher pockets of, uh, of local transmission in some of our communities. And, uh, uh, and, and the reasons for that is, are different in each of those communities. Um, but sending that, that, that targeted messaging out to those communities, it hopefully reinforcing the message to stay at home, stay indoors as much as you can, limit your, your trips outside, limit your trips to, to groceries and things of that nature. So uh, we're hoping over the next couple of days that that will have a, a real impact and especially going into a long Okay, some discussion here about mask wearing, whether or not uh, it, the, the, the medical officer or the medical advice seems to be shifting more towards favor of mask wearing. So some questions about whether or not uh, that will be communicated by anyone in the week ahead. Um, I think that's a good question that we don't know yet. We'll know in a week whether or not anyone did that. <laughs> um, but I think, again, Patrick's uh, example, I, I couldn't agree more, is it's the simple uh, tried and true messages. Um, I, I, I don't, want to, I don't want to dance on the head of the pin on whether you should wear a mask or shouldn't wear a mask. I want people to stay at home and wash their hands and, uh, and, and, and be patient, right? That, that, so those simple messages. Um, anyone else seeing uh, anything significant in a change or a challenge in the week ahead? Just building on what Jessica said around the Crime Stoppers number, uh, at the end of last week, it's all a bit of a blur, but I think it was the end of last week, 
we created a, a dedicated email and phone line for COVID order concerns, and it's been inundated with hundreds of calls every day. So part of our challenge is, is working through those. Um, the recognition is that the majority of them are things that we can't do anything about. Like five people were playing basketball yesterday on this court. We can't do anything about. The main goal was diverting calls from 911 and our public health unit so that we could kind of ease the burden on them and let a community that has concerns report them to us. So I, we need to try and manage um, expectations around what we can do with those calls and what we can't. And also exactly what Patrick said, just reiterating those basic messages. The mass conversation becomes um, interesting when you're thinking about as an employer, because we do have employees coming in who are concerned about their own health and whether or not there's a need for them to be wearing masks. So we're, we're talking about it more from an internal perspective than external right now. Um, the um, uh, Another uh, suggestion was made uh, uh, about the use of robocalls uh, in uh, St. Catharines, Niagara regions using robo robocalls. Last week on our uh, panel discussion, City of Mississauga walked us through their use of teletown halls. They've just announced another one. Uh, they also disclosed that that's about a $45,000 undertaking to do one of those, but for their population, it makes sense. Uh, Patrick, are you guys doing tele town halls uh, in, in York region? So we've done, a, we've done an internal town hall with, uh, with our CAO uh, to staff. Uh, we crashed the system, so uh, we were able to record it and, uh, and post it. So again, lots of, uh, lots of lessons learned. Um, we did, uh, through public health, uh, they did use a, a robocall technique uh, where we had a cluster in two, uh, in two gyms um, in one of our municipalities and we were able to work with the facilities to get uh, uh, the contact names of, uh, of the members and we used robocalls to, to contact them so that they could contact us. Uh, so usually the robocall technique is something that everybody, uh, you know, fears or frowns upon, uh, but, uh, you know, able to turn the, turn the, turn the corner or flip the, flip the, uh, flip the coin on this one and, and use it for people's benefit and are appreciative of, of it uh, in kind. Yeah, okay, I'm going to start to just, oh, sorry. I was just going to say we've been fortunate in Gray Bruce. Um, Gray and Bruce counties together have been working closely in partnership uh, with the health unit, of course, and Bruce Power. Uh, and Bruce Power has the technology and, and has partnered to be able to do uh, these town halls, which are then recorded, which are then shared between the two counties. So we're we're really fortunate and uh, have been able to leverage a lot of that messaging. So everybody's very busy and um, so as we as we wrap uh, we're starting to wind down this call I, I do want to put it out to all the people that are listening uh, whether there's value in having another call in a week um, if if, there, if the demand is there Amos happy to do it uh, we want to be helpful a lot of people have told us that it just gives them peace of mind other people have told us that it's been an absolute lifesaver uh, so, and we got about 130, 140 people on the call today. So I am curious, uh, just if you could, uh, let us know, uh, we, we need to have some sort of signal that, uh, that it's worth, uh, worth doing. Um, I think it also makes sense that we do it in a week. We have had several people sit on a panel. We appreciate the time of the panelists cause you're all, we're all very busy. Um, if you are interested in being a panelist or you've been a panelist and you're willing to do it again. Uh, please let me know. We uh, try to have a range of sizes of communities. Um, and uh, again, the COVID-19 page for AMO uh, provides uh, past recordings of the last two calls. This call is, is being recorded and will be posted as well. Um, so I really just kind of throw this out there just to, to thank the panel, uh, to put an offer out to anyone else who wants to be on the panel. And we'll start organizing based on the feedback I'm seeing here. Uh, we will have a call next Tuesday at 1030. Um, and so now it's just a matter for us to figure out who will be on the panel. If you have questions, by all means, we do welcome questions in advance. Help us help you. Uh, it does help us get ahead around it. Any last thoughts from the panelists before we go? Brian, <clears throat> Brian I just wanted to say I think one of our biggest challenges, and probably everyone can agree, uh, the more restless people get, nice weather is going to be um, a challenge. Um, it's going to certainly be a, a challenge up here in Muskoka. People want to get out. People want to come up here. So the whole enforcement piece is going to be big and uh, trying to maintain, you know, all the messages that we, we, we've been doing so, such a hard job putting out there. Mm -hmm. Just to echo Jason, this afternoon we have in our news release about uh, limitations on fishing. 
and we're talking, you know, we're in Bruce County. That's what we do. Um, so that, you know, that, that one's giving me anxiety, right? Cause I'm going, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want a headline that says you can't go fishing, but it's the right thing to do. Uh, so we're going to tackle that and we're going to do the best we can. Um, and it's the right thing to do. You know, going back to what Patrick said, are we going to get trolls? Are people going to be upset with us? Uh, yeah, they sure will be, but it's the right thing to do. I'll give you some hope. Brian, on that. Big, thank you Amo. big thank you to Amo for organizing this. And, and we talk about the new normals that will come out of this. And, and I hope the new normal is uh, kindness and people just yeah. being nicer to everybody because yeah. we're seeing them now and, and hopefully that will stay uh, when, we're, when we're through with the pandemic. Um, Jessica, I can tell you that the, uh, the, the answer on the anglers is the chat boards, the Facebook pages that they're on. And there's a limited number of those chat boards and they're a very rough and tumble crowd. I know because I'm president of the Port Credit Salmon Trout Association. I sit on the Zone 20 Advisory Council for Lake Ontario. So from time to time, they, they, they get me to deliver the bad news to angry guys and pick up trucks. What are you doing um, this afternoon, Brian? Yeah, well, and the reality, is, the reality is this came up on chat boards this week. And a couple of people posted with how dare people restrict my rights. And if, if somebody has the courage to weigh in and say, use some sense and stay at home, the conversation quickly turns to a pounding uh, where, where everybody turns on that individual. These are mean, ugly chat rooms, uh, but common sense does prevail on those discussions. So just have courage. As Patrick said uh, earlier, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm, 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 you just deliver your message and have faith that the trolls will do their thing, but that one will land in the right place Thank eventually. You. <laughs> Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you for everybody's help and good luck uh, in the week ahead. Stay healthy. Thank, Thank you. you.